Hello and welcome again. In this video, I'll discuss uh, a little bit more about the Miller Rabin primality test. I just mentioned it in the last video, and I also mentioned in the last video uh, some of the general ideas about prob uh, probabilistic uh, primality test. Now, the Miller Rabin primality test is not it's not the only one, it's not the only probability uh, primality test. Uh, there are uh, several of them, but we're going to discuss only this one uh, because otherwise we'll take a long time to discuss all of them. So this test is based on the following uh, theorem, which is of course a theorem of uh, number theory. Uh, I think it's important that you see this where it comes from uh, because it's all based on uh, mathematics. Okay, so let's look at the theorem and what the theorem says uh, basically as the following thing. So this is the theorem. So this uh, P, I'm going to call this P hat. It's not really P hat, but I'm going to call it P hat. Uh, so this P hat is the number that we want to check for primarity. So basically we want to check whether this is a prime or not a prime number. Now we're going to assume that that is an odd integer. Now you don't lose any, any kind of information by assuming this. And the reason for that is because if P is even, then it's really easy to check whether or not P is prime. Now if P is even and P is no two, the number two, then it's already a prime, there's nothing to do. And if P is bigger than two and is even, then it's not prime uh, because it's divisible by two, a number that is not itself. So that's it. So once you implement this kind of algorithm with this theorem, then you have to take into consideration that kind of trivial case of that extreme case where p is even. So that's why it just makes sense to talk about the odd integers in this case, in particular, or odd uh, positive numbers. Now, um, because if it's not positive, then, then you just take the absolute value. It's exactly the same uh, algorithm. So because a p is odd, when you take p hat minus 1, that gives you an even number. So p hat minus 1 is even. And this, what it says here, basically, is what you're doing is taking p hat minus 1 and factoring out the largest power of 2 that goes into p hat minus 1. Uh, so that that's the largest power of 2, and that's why when the other factor has to be an odd integer. Because if this were even, I can factor another power of 2 and put it right here into this power. So basically, what we are saying here is that just p minus 1 is even, and for every even number, you can always factor it out like this. A largest power of 2 that divides that and then another number. So the actual heart of the theorem uh, or the test is this one here. If there is an integer a that is not equal to 0, such that the r power of a is not congruent to 1 modulo p hat. Now the r that you see here is exactly this r that is over there. If that happens and this other thing has to happen too, part b, if a 2 to the j times r. This j is going to run here from 0 to n minus 1, with this n minus 1 is this exponent here of the largest power that divide, largest power of 2 that divides p minus 1. If this quantity is not congruent to p hat minus 1 modulo p hat. Now this p hat minus 1 I can replace it by minus 1 also because p hat minus 1 is the same as minus 1. So you might uh, see maybe this uh, theorem with a minus 1 instead of uh, p hat minus 1. It's exactly the same. So if these two conditions are true, the second one, which has to be true for every j from 0 to n minus 1, then that for sure it says that that number p hat is composite, so meaning it's not a prime. Uh, on the other hand, if either a or b is false, meaning that it's congruent to 1, or there is at least 1j in here that makes this congruent to p hat minus 1, this, exp uh, this um, number here, then p hat is probably a prime. As I mentioned in the previous uh, video, the probability of this uh, test uh, uh, being wrong is very small as long as you choose uh, a number of a's in integers a. And that's what I'm going to discuss now. So the pseudocode of the Miller-Rabin primality test is basically an implementation of, of this theorem here together with a little bit extra that I will explain in a second. So let's look at the pseudocode here of the miller robin primality test. So the input here is going to be the prime candidate, which is p hat, together with this factorization. Now, in reality, you 
if you want to implement this, of course, this is not going to be given to you. You actually have to find it. So in reality, if you were to implement uh, this algorithm in Java or any other programming language, you will actually have to do this computation, meaning that you have to uh, factor p hat minus 1 as the largest power of 2, two times another odd number. Now, you uh, heard me several times mentioning that factoring an, an integer is a really hard problem. Uh, in general, it is. Now, this here looks like I have to factor the number, but this is not a complete factorization. It's just getting the largest power of 2, the device p hat minus 1. This kind of factorization can be done easily with a while loop. So you divide p hat minus 1 by 2, and then you do it again, and then you do it again. I until you cannot do it again, and so that will give you the largest power of 2, that device p hat minus 1, and the way you get r is once you have this power, you just do p hat minus 1 divided by 2 to the u, that will give you the r. So that's why it's not that uh, uh, bad. It's, it's not going to take that much time. So this factorization is could, could be achieved actually quite fast. And I'm going to show you how you get this in just one line of code in Java, this kind of part. So anyway, so these are the two inputs. And there is also something called the security parameter, S. And this security parameter is a natural number. This security parameter basically is the number of A's I'm going to try for this test. If you see here in the theorem, and the theorem says there is an integer A, such that this is true, then that means it's composite. So S is the number of A's I'm going to try, so the number of integers. So for example, I'm going to try 10 of them, so S is 10. So the security parameter is the number of A's that I'm going to try there. Now, in the more you try, usually what happens is the better the uh, probability of this being uh, uh, true is. True meaning that if it gives you a prime, if it if the test says prime is the probability uh, of being a prime is quite high, and that usually usually increases with, with the number of choices of A. All right, so that's what the parameter S is. So we have these two inputs here, and of course the output has to be that either uh, the p hat is composite or p hat is likely a prime number. So let's look at the pseudo code here. The pseudo code that is here that I'm going to show you now is just a translation of the theorem. So with the extra step that I told you, that is the security parameter. So for i equals 1 to s, so basically this for loop that I have here, that's the number of a's I'm going to choose uh, to try the theorem. So, and that's what the second line here is. I choose an a that is uh, between 2 and p hat minus 2. Now, uh, and this is going to be uniformly at random. Now, why is it enough to choose the a's from here? Now, the theorem says that it has to be an integer. So in reality, it could be anything that is larger. But if you go back here to the theorem and look at what the theorem has to do here, you think an integer, and then you're going to take a modulo p hat. When you take modulo p hat, this a, once you take the modulo, because everything that matters here is the remainder when you divide by p hat. So basically, when you take a number and you take the remainder when divided by p hat, you get a, you get uh, 0, 1 up to p hat minus 1. So it reduces your uh, number of numbers that you actually have to try. You don't have to try them all. You have to try them from 0 to p hat minus 1. Now, we don't try 0 because uh, the theorem, of course, says from not equal to 0. Now, why don't we try a equals 1? Because here in the, in the algorithm, we we'll start from 2. Well, we don't try 1 because we know for sure that this guy if a is equal to 1, this part a won't be true. Because if a is 1, so 1, of course, to the r is congruent to 1 modulo p hat. And the other one when it's uh, p minus 1, uh, something similar is going to happen. So those are like kind of trivial cases that you don't try because uh, that's going to always give you uh, something that is uh, not true here. So that, that's basically the idea. So we're only going to uh, check numbers that are from 2 to p hat minus 2. So you're going to choose this at random. How do you do that? Well, there's a way to do this in Java. You can choose a random number in Java or any other programming language in certain range. So that's not difficult to do. 
and now this uh, if a statement that is here um, so basically what it's saying is I'm gonna take this power of 2 to the uh, 2 to the p hat minus 1 and if it is not congruent to one modulo p hat then it's gonna be composed now basically uh, this part even though it's based on that theorem this is basically the Fermat the Fermat theorem in place because if this were congruent to one modulo p, um, if, if it's not equal to not congruent to one, then for sure this number cannot be a prime because the contrapositive is true. If something is prime, then this is true. So if this is not true, then that that number is not prime. So that's basically what this is uh, based on uh, here. Uh, now, one thing uh, that I have to mention is because we want to uh, do this in a fast way. So this is a modular exponentiation that you have to do here. So you want to do that with fast modular exponentiation. Uh, the only one we saw basically was the square multiply algorithm. So what you will do a square multiply algorithm here to check that. So that's the first part. The second part is the one that's going to check the whole thing uh, for the power. So this one. So the second one. Okay. Also, uh, one thing I have to emphasize here. Once you are sure that this is true. If this happens, you return composite and then you stop the algorithm. There's nothing else to do. So the algorithm stops there. Now for the other for loop, basically the other for loop that is here, that I will explain in a second, what that's going to do is going to run through all of these uh, guys that are here. All of this. All right. Uh, so let's look at that. Let's look at that for loop. So if you have this, that uh, this u that's j that is here is going to run from uh, 1 to u use the uh, the exponent of the 2 in the factorization of p hat minus 1 so you take this power which you do with the square multiplier algorithm and if this is congruent to 1 modulo p hat and 1 power less here in the 2 a 2 to the j minus 1 times r if this is not congruent to 1 plus or minus um, plus or minus 1 and then modulo p hat Again, this exp uh, modular exponentiation, you do it with, uh, you could do it with this square multiply algorithm. If these two things happen, you're going to return that is composite and you stop there. Um, this part of the algorithm is, of course, based on the theorem, but it's, uh, I'm going to emphasize that part there. This is basically based on this lemma. If you have two integers, x and n, in such a way that x squared is congruent to 1 modulo n, and x is not congruent to plus or minus 1 modulo n, then that will imply that n has to be composite. Uh, this is an easy lemma to prove. If you notice that if you have a prime number, a prime number device, if we device a number, it divides a pro, uh, any decomposition of the number into two. So basically what you're gonna do is, the proof will be if n divides x squared minus one, n divides x minus one or x plus one. If it doesn't happen, if it doesn't happen, then n cannot be a prime number, otherwise, this will have to happen. Either it's congruent to 1 or minus 1. So basically, that's all I have to say. I mean, I, do, I was not very clear on this, but all of this, basically what I'm saying is, this is all come from number theory. So if this is happens, of course, you're going to return that, that number is composite. And you are uh, in the if loop here, and then if you return composite, you just basically stop. That's the for loop for all the powers of uh, 2 that are there in this composition of p hat minus 1. Once you end the for loop and nothing has happened, you never said that is composite or composite here in these ifs, then you're gonna return that is probably a prime. Uh, that's what the for loop is, is here for. So you can check several a's, and then once you reach the end, then you will get um, a probable answer. So I mentioned that lemma already. Uh, so let me emphasize that. I said that this, this already is. The miller rabin test could still give a false prime meaning that it says that p hat is prime when it is actually composite. Remember that it's a small probability for what for that to happen. That probability of ha that happening is related to the number s, the security parameter that I mentioned earlier. So suppose we want a probability of less than 2 to the negative 80 that a composite is detected as prime, meaning that the miller rabin test will actually lie. It will tell us that something is prime when in reality it's not. So there is a way, and um, I'm not going to do that, but there is a way of doing this. You set up your 
probability. So you set up a small probability for which uh, the miller ramin test will lie, and you can actually compute how many, uh, what is the parameter S here. So if you were to implement, really implement a whole miller ramin uh, algorithm uh, test here, you will actually have to compute your S. But for this case, uh, let's just base our uh, S's in here. So I have a little chart here that was computed with that uh, probability. So if I allowed the Ravin, uh, Mil uh, miller ravin test to lie, to be incorrect this much, which is, remember, this is a very, really slow probability, then uh, you can compute the security parameter S uh, with the bit length of P. So if you have the bit length of P is 250 uh, bits, then you want to set up your S to 12. So basically you're gonna uh, randomly choose 12 numbers between two and P hat minus two. And if you see what is here, does when as long as you increase your bit length, then the number of times you have to try S is uh, less. Um, now there's again uh, there is a way to compute what is this parameter s depending on the bit length of p. Um, so you want to be safe. For example, if you do let's say for example thirty s equal to thirty, you will be more than safe to achieve this small probability of the test line. So so that's basically what the Miller test uh, uh, Miller Rabin test algorithm does. Uh, again, uh, I'm going to scroll back here and say. Uh, the really the only input that a true miller ravin test should have is it should be just uh, the candidate and maybe the probability that you allow that uh, the test to lie. Uh, these other things here could be computed inside the algorithm. Now the way we're gonna look at this in Java. So for Java, the implementation of this is we're going to ask only for p hat and the security parameter, and we will compute this. So we will we will need this as the input for this. So uh, I'm going to stop the video uh, now. Uh, but in the next video, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a couple of examples uh, of this Miller Rabin test using uh, this kind of uh, this pseudo code here. And, and later, after that, we will implement this uh, this middle Ravin test in Java using this pseudo code uh, that we have that we have here. So uh, I hope this was helpful for you, and I will see you in the next video.